Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for coming out so early on a Friday. My name is Frank Lenodo. I'm director of the Asian Pacific American Program at the Smithsonian and a curator at the American History Museum. I want to welcome you to the second day of this extraordinary symposium, exploring the exchanges between Asia and America. I first want to thank the organizers of this conference, and especially Cynthia Mills and Amelia Gerlitz, as well as the director of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, Dr. Elizabeth Brun. Betsy has been an inspiring colleague for me at the Smithsonian. Her unwavering dedication to the well-being of the institution as a whole and her commitment to excellence in collections, programs, and scholarship. I thank, too, the Terra Foundation for its generous support of this symp symposium. In these difficult times, this kind of support is exceedingly welcome. We are now beginning to understand just how important art was and is in interpreting the long and involved and important history of peoples of Asian and Pacific Islander heritage in the United States. This sh should not have come as much of a surprise since all immigrants and refugees bring their cultures with them, music, politics, ideologies, religions, games, vices. But even when scholarship about and by Asian Americans began in earnest after students and community community leaders shut down San Francisco State uh, University demanding ethnic studies in 1969. And yes, this year we commemorate, commemorate the 40th anniversary of that strike. And I just want to add parenthetically, that strike was an extraordinary thing to me of, of students who were willing, many of whom were first in, in their families to go to college, jeopardizing their college careers to study something, to study something. Anyway, the Smithsonian Congress of Scholars is contemplating a major exploration of the impact of ethnic studies on the Smithsonian itself early next year, 2010. Even after that turbulent and auspicious beginning, serious study of APA art is fairly recent and our scholars were relatively marginal in the field. This is no longer the case where we looked first to labor and social history in the first few decades after 1970, this century has seen the field expand exponentially. For this development, we thank our colleagues who had the imagination and foresight to understand just how important visual art artists were in interpreting the worlds around us. Bert Winter Tamaki, Gordon Chang, we thank you uh, for participating in this symposium and we welcome you and your insights here. I want to end with a note that may be of some interest to those of you accustomed to thinking of universities as the leading edge of progressive social change in America. While ethnic studies and calls for diversity may have uh, first been sounded on our campuses, some of the most dramatic changes have come in institutions we normally consider to be very conservative. I have in mind um, certainly the military with women in general officer leadership roles, and folks like Colin Powell and Eric Shinseki routinely deemed acceptable. But the Smithsonian too, arguably and historically conservative force, has a very large National Museum of the American Indian and a new Museum of African American History and Culture scheduled to open in 2015. And there's a formal commission now studying the creation of the American Latino Museum. I know of no universities with such formidable representation of what we call minority groups. And yes, this is a mixed message since the creation of these institutions reflects, at least in part, the failure of our traditional museums to incorporate adequately the experiences of these groups and to make them sufficiently integral to the interpretations of our national culture and history, interpretations we so desperately need. This symposium, on the other hand, is recognition that global exchange can be discerned in the experiences and prism of communities right in our midst. I congratulate the organizers, including the American Art Museum here, Freer and Sackler Galleries, and Terra, 
and welcome you all to another day of exciting discourse. Now, allow me to introduce our first speaker for this morning's session. Patricia Johnston is professor of art history at Salem State College. She's the author of Real Fantasies, Edward Steichen's Advertising Photography, and editor of the highly respected collection, Seeing High and Low, Representing Social Conflict in American Visual Culture. She is planning a symposium in Salem in fall 2010 on the topic of her current research, visual art and global trade in the early republic. Patricia. On a cold January day in 1804, the Reverend William Bentley, pastor of Salem's East Church, stood and watched a strange and exotic sight weave through the streets of the city. A number of sea captains who just returned from Sumatra, Bombay, Calcutta, Canton, M Manila, and other Asian ports put on a public display to commemorate their recent business adventures. Bentley recorded in his diary, this day is the annual meeting of the East India Marine Society. After business and before dinner, they moved in procession. Each of the brethren bore some Indian curiosity. And the palanquin was borne by the Negroes, dressed nearly in the Indian manner. A person dressed in Chinese habits and mask passed in front. The crowd of spectators was great. <coughs> the objects that the minister described demonstrate the global circulation of material culture in the early republic. Waiting in Asian harbors for trade opportunities, captains and crews swapped souvenirs that had literally circled the world. When they returned to their hometowns, they shared the objects they collected both privately with acquaintances and publicly in museums and parades that were widely covered in the newspapers. The global artifacts collected in the early republic provide insights into the broad intellectual pursuits of the era, including natural history, ethnography, and aesthetics. Objects also illuminate early trade relations and cultural perceptions between Asia and the new United States. When displayed back in the United States, artifacts helped construct and reinforce social hierarchies in American seaports. They also expressed America's arrival as a full participant in world commerce. Bentley's reference to the material culture of India and China carried through the streets of Salem, described a public celebration of the international trade that had changed the identity and character of the town over the previous 20 years. In the colonial period, Salem had been a flourishing fishing and trading village known mostly for its infamous witch trials. The British Navigation Acts of 1660 and 1663 allowed the North American colonies access to the lucrative Caribbean trade. And for 150 years, Salem vessels regularly voyaged to other British colonial ports to exchange corn, cod, and timber for sugar, molasses, and occasionally slaves. After the American Revolution, however, the town's prosperity reached a new order of magnitude with the introduction of the East Indies and China trades in 1785. By the turn of the 19th century, Salem was the sixth largest city in the new United States, boasting the highest per capita income in the country derived from its fleet of over 200 trading vessels. Though the China trade is best known, Salem's wealth derived more generally from the East Indies trade, Salem dominated the silk and cotton trade with India and the pepper trade with Sumatra. With global commerce came an increased demand for geographical knowledge, and institutions developed in Salem to meet this need. In the colonial period, strong kinship and social networks were the primary conduits of global knowledge, augmented by some fledgling libraries and fraternal groups. These associations became stronger in the federal period, as more institutional venues, such as libraries, retail establishments, and the museum, emerged to circulate ideas and information. In Salem, those who had, global, uh, those who had firsthand global seafaring experience interacted with those who learned about the world through study. Exchanges of texts, images, and objects became the basis of deep fraternal bonding and played a role in solidifying the town's class hierarchies an elite class developed,
characterized and united by knowledge of the wider world, particularly Asia and the rest of the Pacific Basin. In the colonial period, every substantial port organized marine societies. These charitable organizations provided assistance to those widowed and orphaned by the dangerous sea life. Founded in 1799, Salem's East India Marine Society was more select. It was limited to sea captains and supercargoes, that is the head traders, who had rounded either the Cape of Good Hope or Cape Horn. Thus, right from the outset, the bylaws of the East India Marine Society defined the elite of Salem's elite. Because of this restriction, there were only 22 members at its founding in 1799, although the number grew close to 50 members by 1800 and 100 members by 1805, <coughs> numbers that are indicative of the extent and global reach of Salem's trade. Books, voyage journals, and nautical charts were key components of the East India Marine Society's collecting activities. These provided the members with information and thus a competitive edge. Though other libraries offered a large selection of published sea chronicles, the East India Marine Society Library focused on very expensive volumes that even their well-off members chose not to purchase for their personal collections. Among the first acquisitions was the large 1798 London edition of La Perouse's Voyages, with deluxe engravings copied after the French edition published the year before. Another early purchase was the lavishly illustrated account of Vancouver's voyages. La Perouse and Vancouver were the most popular volumes in the East India Marine Society Library, perhaps because the two explorers traveled to the less well-known parts of the Pacific, such as the northwest coast of North America and the South Sea Islands, which Salem mariners saw as the next areas of opportunity. The East India Marine Society also collected and loaned coastal charts that were consulted frequently before voyages. Perhaps most importantly, the East India Marine Society collected new first-hand information. The bylaws required that all members returning from voyages present their journals to the library committee. And beginning in 1801, the society even provided blank printed journals um, for the seafarers. Nathaniel Bowditch, author of the path-breaking New American Practical Navigator was named the inspector of journals after he returned from his last Asian voyage in 1804. Bowditch arranged, analyzed, and bound the journals to allow members easy, easier access to information on maneuvering harbors and conducting trade. These journals were sometimes illust illustrated with images. For example, these drawings by William Haswell of the Port of Manila illustrate the standard conventions for how mariners synthesized crucial information about harbor depths and hazards into the topographic form of nautical charts. They used this information in conjunction with their own personal observations as the basis of landscape drawings to depict harbors as they were experienced during arrival by sea. What was unique in Salem, as curator Daniel Fenimore has observed, was that members of the East India Marine Society were expected to contribute curiosities that they had collected personally. <coughs> Mariners had always collected mementos of their voyages. Before the establishment of museums in America, these objects circulated much as books did, through family and friendship networks. Captain Jonathan Karn seems to have been the driving force behind the idea of a museum. Returning from Sumatra, Karns donated objects from the natural world including various shells and an elephant's tooth, and cultural artifacts, including elaborate Malaysian gold boxes. Within two years, Reverend Bentley recorded in his diary that over 185 articles were on display. He wrote that at the museum he saw, quote, images and paintings of Hindustan, China, and Japan, with complete dresses in the Chinese fashion intermingled with various specimens of the various oyster shells of Sumatra, the albatross, birds of paradise, parakeets, and several birds, some antiquities, a few specimens of stones, ores, and so forth not arranged, petrifications and curiosities." End quote. Reverend Bentley fully supported the enterprise, calling the plan for a museum a liberal and important design. 
Bentley, a naturalist as well as a theologian, used the term liberal in the Enlightenment sense of scientific inquiry. Both Bentley and the Salem Sea Captain saw the value of collecting as far more than entertainment. It was firsthand participation in the 18th century quest to study and make available natural history. Bentley built one of the great private libraries in early America, owning over 4,000 books, and he also maintained a personal cabinet. Knowing the minister's deep interest in natural history, Reverend Bentley's seagoing parishioners often brought him exotica from their journeys. His diary mentions such gifts in 1788, after he had been settled at the East Church for nearly five years. Captain Elkins gave him a Chinese razor. Captain West brought him Chinese copper coins. Captain Benjamin Hodges, Bentley's close friend, presented him with some of the most intriguing items in his collection. In 1790, Hodges gave the minister, quote, a pike or spear of wood with a bow and two arrows brought by the American ship Columbia from Nootka Sound, that's present day British Columbia, to Canton and specimens of cloth from the Sandwich Islands, that's present day Hawaii. Though Hodges had gone to China along the traditional Salem route of the 18th century, that is via the Cape of Good Hope and the Isle de France, which is now Mauritius, uh, then across the Indian Ocean and onto China, the first artifacts he presented to his friend were items from the American side of the Pacific Basin where he had not traveled. From the same China trade season of 1790, Captain Henry Elkins also gave the minister Native American hooks and cloth from the Northwest Coast, um, along with French and Dutch coins, and a specimen of Chinese writing. Thus the artifacts the, ca the captains brought back were truly global from all around the world, not simply evidence of where individuals had voyaged. For Bentley, these objects were guides for learning about the physical world. Bentley is the Salem figure who comes closest to the ideal of collecting for the intensive study of natural history, pursued in America, for example, by Charles Wilson Peale, who based much of his, the collecting and arrangement of his museum on the Linnaean system. Salem ministers, professional men, and sea captains were well aware of the efforts in Philadelphia to develop a, a philosophical society, to publish journals on the model of the royal philosophical transactions, and to display objects to educate viewers about the natural world. Some Salem mariners even donated objects to Peel's museum before the founding of their own. Bentley's worldview was challenged and transformed through his encyclopedic reading and intensive study of global artifacts. He concluded that knowledge of all parts of the globe, his, ideal, his idealistic goal, might prove impossible. And trained in traditional congregational theology, as early as 1788, he moved toward what he called a more rational Christianity. He said he was, quote, ready to receive truth upon proper evidence from whatever quarter it may come, end quote. He worried about doubting the Trinity, and he began a slow drift to what would eventually become Unitarianism. Some of the objects brought back to America may have been perceived as having a value as fine art as well as curiosities. For instance, in his 1788 to 1790 voyage to China, Captain Hodges gave Reverend Bentley one of the most significant Chinese sculptures now in the collection of the Peabody Essex Museum. Bentley described, quote, the image of a mandarin exceeding two feet in height, richly ornamented in the habit of his order, end quote. This sculpture is unusual in that it has moving parts. It is a nodder in which a weight on a wire slides into the hollow clay body, triggering another wire to move the head and arm as it descends. Bentley noted the motion was not graceful. Rather, it evoked a realism that, as he described it, inspired the idea of life. He had high praise for the craftsmanship of the textiles the figure wears, describing the red apron embroidered with a dragon and the beautiful blue of the gown. This is perhaps the earliest Chinese artistic sculpture exported to the American market. But preceding it was a strong tradition of early clay Chinese portrait sculpture exported to Britain and the continent throughout the 18th century. Bentley was certainly attuned to contemporary discourses about sculpture as a fine art, and he may have perceived his gift as such. What did global artifacts mean to mariners when they were brought home? For the collector, certainly, souvenirs enhanced personal memories. Objects also signaled their owner's success, 
for life at sea was grueling, and completing a, joy, a voyage a recognized achievement for any rank of sailor. For captains and traders, artifacts had another layer of significance as signs of essential scientific, practical, and commercial knowledge. Those who possessed and displayed these Asian curiosities were men of accomplishment who had led a successful voyage and also returned a good profit to their investors. Beyond symbols of successful trading voyages, exotic curiosities were signs of American achievement. They reinforced an emerging national identity as former British colonials who were becoming significant players in the global economy. Some hints about the meanings that the collection held for society members can be discerned from the toasts proposed at each of their annual meetings. Toasts at fraternal organizations in the early republic signaled far more than momentary sentiment in the midst of a social event. Toasts were prepared and written out in advance by committee and then often sent to the local newspaper to publish. They presented the elite perspective on important social, political, and intellectual currents of the day. From the very first, some of the toasts at the East India Marine Society dinners were dedicated to the collection. From 1804 is this toast, which commemorate, was, was commemorated with drinks served from these very punch bowls, to a cabinet that every mariner may possess the history of the world. <laughs> this toast clearly defines objects as the source of knowledge, and it gives history an expansive resonance, evoking natural history as well as political history. Another toast from 1804. To natural history, may commerce never forget its obligations. <laughs> this toast suggests that beyond economic motives, the captains and the merchants practiced learned and gentlemanly pursuits such as geographical and scientific inquiry. At the elaborate dinners, toasts often linked multiple types of knowledge that are con today considered more distinct, and they suggested that this knowledge would bring practical mercantile benefits. Three toasts from 1809 make clear that the mariners, at least these New England Federalist mariners, saw free trade as an essential part of American national identity. After the standard toast to George Washington and Christopher Columbus and the American Navy were the following. To commerce, it is our birthright and ought to be as free as the winds which waft our ships. Okay, now imagine you're drinking several glasses of brandy, rum, gin, Madeira, and you're in a room filled with a hundred the smoke from a hundred cigars. Okay. To the cause of liberty throughout the world. Have another glass. <laughs> to American enterprise, may it never be restrained by lawless power or rival jealousy. <laughs> Taken together, these toasts reveal that this fraternal organization was bound together by useful, specialized, global knowledge. The collection not only reinforced the wonders of nature, it reinforced the members' perception as men of knowledge, taste, civilization, leadership, and business acumen. But what did mariners think of their Asian trading partners? Their journals and logs and their letters home leave no doubt that they believed in their own cultural superiority. They saw themselves as recently released from the bondage of British colonialism uh, that had controlled their mercantile exchanges and as we have seen, they believed mightily in the right to free trade. They were continually frustrated by the elaborate Chinese trading system, which confined outsiders to a small area of Canton and insisted that all commerce filter through the designated trading posts called Hongs, which you see here in this image of Canton. Language barriers were great, as was suspicion on both sides. In general, American seamen saw the Chinese as dishonest, superstitious, cruel, corrupt, as well as oppressed by the authoritarian rule of the emperor. But they sailed to the other side of the world because they valued Chinese inventiveness and craftsmanship, particularly in the production of porcelain and silks, technologies that could not yet be replicated in Europe or America, and because they wanted tea. The only way to break down such wariness and suspicion was to develop relationships among individuals. Mariners operated in contact zones between cultures, and global knowledge gave mariners the confidence and ability to operate in these zones. In her book, Yankee India, 
Susan Bean described how gifts between American and Asian merchants de help develop friendly, reliable business relationships. For example, when the Bombay merchant Nusserwanji learned that the Salem captain George Nichols was engaged to be married upon his return, he helped him select the highest quality fabric for his fiance's wedding dress. The merchant then gave uh, um, the merchant then gave the captain an elegant camel's hair shawl for his future wife. And the captain reciprocated by giving the Indian merchant the 20 volume illustrated set of Maver's Voyages, a fairly expensive collection of tales of historical sea expeditions that was popular in Salem. In 1803, Nusser Wanji donated objects directly to the new museum in Salem. As a Parsi, a member of an ethnic and religious group in India descended from ancient migrations of Persian Zoroastrians, Nusserwanji was a minority in a land of Hindus and Muslims. Thus, the merchant may have been especially sensitive to intercultural contacts. His gifts to the museum, shoes, a robe, shawl, and a turban that make up a complete Parsi dress, educated Americans about the ethnic complexities of India, as well as the specifics of his own group. The same year, the Salem captain, John R. Dolling, gave the museum an oil painting of Nusserwanji, which became the basis for a sculpture of the Indian merchant that the East India Marine Society commissioned to display the clothing he had donated. At the museum, Nusserwanji shared a home with a life-size figure of Yanqua, a Chinese merchant that Captain Benjamin Hodges gave as a gift to the museum in 1801. Museum records are sketchy. They say Hodges donated an original dress of Yanqua. The body was formed of iron and fabric by carpenter Jonathan Bright in Salem, and the head and hands carved in wood by Samuel McIntyre and likely painted by Michelle Felice Cornet. Carl Crossman has suggested that McIntyre worked from an original guide, perhaps a clay portrait that had broken because the realism is readily apparent right down to the, small, the smallpox scars on the merchant's face. Or McIntyre may have worked from Hodge's description of the merchant. Visitors never failed to remark on the dramatic and authentic impression made by life-size sculpture, sculptures of Asian merchants. These Asian merchants were the elite counterparts to American traders. As such, they were presented as individuals, unlike the more generic representation of cultures in the society's cabinet. While they, were, while they reminded sea captains of their trustworthy agents abroad, more importantly, they illustrated the complexities of global trade and acknowledged the Salem captain's ownership of privi privileged contacts and information. International trade was the basis for Salem's wealth in the early republic. Institutions such as libraries, fraternal organizations, and the museum arose to meet the deep desire for global knowledge. Knowledge of the global artifacts was widespread throughout the town. Even those who did not venture into the East India Marine Society's museum saw the curiosities as they were carried through the streets of the city on the days of the society's meeting, or they read descriptions in the newspapers. Ownership of objects from the South Seas, India, China, Indonesia, and other places signified possession of specialized knowledge, which was associated with elite status as was the wearing of imported silks and cashmere shawls and using ivory fans and elaborate sets of Chinese porcelains, especially if they were personalized with monograms that reinforced their direct connections. Thus, global artifacts contributed to and reinforced social hierarchies. And as physical embodiments of the new American international trade, global artifacts also symbolized America's new place in international commerce. Thank you.